So we know that much of the concern over the past summer for all of us was what are the impacts of all of this on our lungs, what are the short-term impacts, what are the longer-term impacts, what should we be doing for our vulnerable communities. We've always thought of shelters as being a winter kind of thing. Do we need shelters in the summertime now? Our next panel um, is going to address many of those both individual and community <coughs> issues. And I want to introduce Belle Shepard, who will be the moderator of this panel. Bell is the an innovator agent with the Oregon Health Authority, which and she supports health systems transformation with local coordinated care organizations and the communities of four southern Oregon counties. <coughs> Her prior experience includes positions as the Jackson County Public Health Division Manager and the Josephine County Public Health Division Manager. Bell holds a master's in public health from the University of Washington. And we welcome her. Marsh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can try that again. We're almost there. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Now we're having a conversation. I just wanted to ask if you would raise your hand if you felt like you had a health effect from the smoke this summer. So maybe watery eyes or a cough. Depression. Or keep your hands up. Depression. Or something more serious, maybe um, asthma was acerbated or COPD. Those that aren't raising your hand, I'm surprised, but majority of people are raising their hands. Um, you know, we are all kind of in this together, as we know. I think this is a really um, concerning piece, but it's also a thing that can bring us together as a community, I think, to be more resilient in terms of our conversations. I appreciate the first panel really talking about how we work from different sides of this perspective, and when we come from a health thing, I think we're all on the same side of the perspective. We know it's affecting us that are in the room, probably affecting all of those that aren't in this room as well. So I hope we kind of keep that in mind and really think about how we can help our neighbors and be a more resilient community as we move this forward. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, I'll just go ahead and give all introductions and then I'll ask them to speak individually. So Lillian Shirley is the Director of Oregon Health Authority's Public Health Division. She most recently led the Multnomah County Health Department. She served as Vice Chair of the Oregon Health Policy Board which designed Oregon's transformation plan and is founding chair of HealthShare, Oregon's largest coordinated care organization. Ms. Shirley has served on several boards, including the Public Health Foundation and the Oregon Public Health Institute, and a little bird told me it's her birthday, too. Oh. Oh. <laughs> So be nice. No. Um, Dr. Richard Lehman um, is the Chief Medical Officer for Health Security Preparedness and Response and a Medical Epidemiologist and Tribal Epidemiology Liaison for Oregon Health Authority's <coughs> Public Health Division. So kind of a big job there. He has worked in multiple capacities at the Public Health Division, including as a chronic disease <coughs> epidemiologist. Past positions include Epidemic Intelligence Surveillance Service Officer for the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, primary care physician at Multnomah County Health Department, and medical director at the Seelitz Community Health Center. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. And Jackson Bowers <coughs> manages Jackson County Public Health Division, which provides numerous programs and services, including communicable disease, maternal and child health, health promotion, prevention, and environmental public health. He holds a master's in management from Southern Oregon University. It's here and a graduate certificate in public health from OHSU. His prior roles with Jackson County include Environmental Public Health Division Manager and Health and Human Services Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. Thanks, Jackson. I'm gonna join you up there, but Lillian, I'm gonna have you kick us off and talk about um, your role and the work OHA does. Thanks very much. I think we've tried to also today, just by who's on the panel, to talk about how we're in this together as a system across Oregon uh, and how we need to build on different roles. The forest management discussion that we just had was really wonderful and I think it highlights <coughs> that there are no simple answers to this incredibly complex <coughs> problem that, are, that we're in that's our reality and will be facing us for quite a while. And in addition to the complexity of it, we realize that there's no there's no one true bullet, there's no one true way to look at it, and in this, we're going to have to work through com building community solutions and understanding uh, some of the consequences of it. I, um, I was telling Belle, uh, when we were preparing for this, you know, uh, 
even though I'm, I live in the northern part of the state in the Miami <coughs> County area, uh, just around Labor Day, I got two emails from a friend saying, can anybody come and stay with one with somebody's mother and the other with somebody's father, who actually lived down here. And because of the air quality, they had to leave and were li living with their children uh, up in the Portland area. And uh, school was going back, and people were going back to teaching jobs, et cetera, and they needed, they were asking, can somebody stay and help? Help us because we can't leave. Both families felt they couldn't leave their parent alone, uh, and they didn't feel that it was safe yet to have them return to their own home. So I think that um, that just, for me, illustrates on many levels across our society right now and across our state, the impacts, <coughs> the obvious day-to-day -day impacts of the air quality monitoring and the smoke that you may see on the ridge uh, when you're camping, that happened to me last summer, uh, you know, that we forget that there's these unseen consequences that we're going to have to prepare for and make sure that we have these supports across, across all of our all of our communities. Um, I'm here to just mention the kinds of things that the Oregon Health Authority and the Public Health Division does, and uh, some of the things we've learned from the last, uh, actually this is three of four bad summers, and uh, what we need to really get together, not as a response for what's happening in the summer, for our air quality and our health status, but also how do we prepare once uh, once we get into the rainy season, we should be, what are some of the things that we're going to be looking at together with your hospitals and health systems and your insurers to think about next year and prepare going forward, and some of the changes that we've made to. Um, we provide supportive role of wildfire responses and the wildfire smoke events. And one of the things that we've learned over the last couple of years is we work much closer than we ever have in it with an understanding of all of our forest service professionals, our firefighters, uh, both wildland and structure fires, and our state agencies that are around natural resources. So that we've really come together on a state level to plan together and to understand uh, if we're going to look at works around controlled burns, for instance, there was some measure of discussion about that earlier. Right now, we have public health sitting in those discussions to say, what, what are the factors that we should be considering? What are the possible consequences? And what are some of the information that we need to know into those decisions? Not just for the ecosystem, but also for the personal health of the people in the region as well. So I think that that's something that's come out in the last couple of years, learning how to approach this together. <coughs> um, we have an Ar Oregon, I'm sorry, I'm <coughs> suffering the 2.1, 2.9 mile walk here. <laughs> 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 With other organizations, we've developed this response protocol for severe smoke episodes so that we can respond more quickly. We know where to look for the data and we know how to interpret the data more rapidly and get the communications out to the community. We've also improved access to health information. We've uh, had a concerted effort to translate all of our wildfire smoke communication tools uh, for many partners to use, uh, for the disability community to use, as well as um, English as a second language communities to use. And we've developed guidance that assists tribal and local partners in making determinations in their local communities about how to decide how to create a cleaner air space. Um, what we do at the state level as a resource for all of you is we have systems in real time uh, to look at <coughs> monitoring air quality with the Department of Environmental Quality. And we also have a system that tells us in real time emergency room visits for what we would consider um, smoke-related or potentially smoke-related illnesses that would be unusual in the community, whether they would be uh, connected to cardiovascular events or connected to uh, any kind of lung problems that people might have or exasperations or pre-existing conditions. And we share that real-time information uh, with our local partners. Uh, and then we use uh, we we were able after last uh, during last year's fire season to work with um, the federal government, uh, the Medicaid and Medicare agency, and to actually get permission to have the information about people in our communities that are dependent upon uh, electronic health 
and aid. So think of your uh, CPACs, think of your oxygen tanks, think of other uh, people who we can find out on a macro level in a community. You know, where do people live who have uh, uh, problems with transportation, et cetera. And so that makes us more capable of working with the community about what are the communities or where do people live who are particularly vulnerable in any kind of an emerging smoke event. Or in, you know, hopefully not, but if there's a, a need for an evacuation, how can we target people who need that help? It also helps us knowing where those people, where the first responders will relocate those people. And then we'll be able to follow that information to make sure that people get any medicines that they need, any uh, oxygen tanks is, is a big one uh, to be able to make sure that people are able to get those uh, referrals if you don't know where they are and if your providers don't know where you are to make sure that that is a seamless system. And that is uh, something else that we've been able to develop over the last two fire uh, seasons and with community first responders. Um, we've also been able to, uh, the other innovation that has happened is that um, when the governor declares an emergency, we are then allowed to, uh, what we developed last year is we're allowed to have kind of emergency support for people who don't have licenses to practice in our state. So in the recent fire season, or the, recent, the fire season we're still in, we actually had 147 <coughs> emergency medical personnel that came from out of state to support the work here uh, in Southern Oregon. To, um, that are authorized for their temporary licenses to work here. And as most of you know, whenever, wherever you have a fire crew on the ground, you have to have um, medical support. So this was a bad year all around on the West Coast. So last year we depended a lot from people from California. This year, not so much. Uh, we were getting uh, first responders coming into the state from Idaho and uh, other parts of Washington and even as far away as Montana. So these are the kinds of things that we're learning how can we better support and protect the community in real time. Um, the other thing we've done is uh, try to figure out a system to really look at this issue of temporary room air filters. Like what does work, what doesn't work? How many square feet are you in? How many, uh, how many, if you, how many square feet? How much, uh, you know, capacity do you need and what you're going to make a decision about purchasing. Trying to work, and uh, Jackson will refer more to this, but locally, if you do have public shelters, can we over this winter really start looking at how many square feet we need? How can we help more public buildings be on inventories for people to know in their community where they are and have better access to them? And how can we support those public buildings to know what is effective and how much capacity will they need uh, over a longer period of time. So we continue to provide information. We continue to provide evidence-based guidance uh, to help guide decision-making on the local level. And uh, we're trying to leverage all of our partnerships across the state and in other sectors that are concerned. Uh, your local providers, your local community, um, you know, associated with hospitals and private practices to really work together to find out what their real experience is and what is it that we can provide for you. The bad news is, I don't have an answer. You know, we're going to have to work on this together, but I do want to point out that we are working across the West um, and I'm working closely with um, the, my colleagues in the state of California, uh, and there we're looking at how do we get on the national agenda more research around long-term chronic effects um, of, of living in this new reality. And we also know that communities can look at um, other ways. There are other ways that you get um, these particulates in the air. And can we decrease particulates in other sectors or other ways within uh, looking at manufacturing and transportation so that the total burden caused in the air by the wildfire seasons you know, can be mitigated in other ways, kind of balancing those things out. So thank you very much for inviting us, and thank you for uh, all of your resilience. <laughs> so Dr. Lino, I want you to speak about uh, the health effects of smoke. Sure. Well, thank you, Bill. And I also wanted to thank uh, uh, 
Pam, Marsh, and Paige, as well as Bill, for organizing this, and thank, thanks to all of you for being here. So my topic is health effects. So a good place to start, I think, is what's in wildfire smoke that might cause problems. There are gases in wildfire smoke, uh, most notably carbon monoxide, which at high levels can, uh, can rob uh, the body of oxygen, make it tough for the blood to take up oxygen. Uh, happily, this is not something that moves very far from the fire, and it's mainly a problem for firefighters who are uh, right there kind of cleaning up the smoldering hot spots. Uh, there are aromatic hydrocarbons, and that's kind of a long name that's based on the chemical structure of these. But long story short, these are like the, the things that are in the tar from cigarettes. And uh, if you're exposed to a lot of that over many years, it may increase the risk of some kinds of cancer. Uh, these come from many different sources, and we think actually that uh, even with a longer fire season, the total amount, the total fraction, uh, that you get from wildfire smoke is not very high. Um, but of course you want to avoid any of it that you can. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to particles. And some of these are very small, less than the width of a human hair, and these are actually the things that are causing the highest risk for acute illness. And this is, this is important, particularly for people who have underlying heart disease or lung disease. So uh, your risk of having symptoms from being exposed to wildfire smoke is determined by several things. First of all, what's in the smoke? We just talked about that a bit. The amount of smoke that's coming through, uh, how long totally you're exposed to it. And this is important, underlying uh, health conditions that people have. The biggest risk, and this is important, the biggest risk is for people who have underlying heart disease or lung disease. And let's talk about the health effects a bit. So short term, I don't need to tell you folks this, I mean, as Bell was mentioning, you know, stinging, burning eyes and, and uh, you know, irritated throat and cough and Unfortunately, most of us, if we get exposed to enough smoke, we're going to experience those, and those are really a, da a drag. And I, I know that, and I hate it when I'm exposed to it, too. I, I guess the only good thing about that is typically uh, once you get rid of the smoke, it goes away, and those symptoms go away, uh, and they tend not to cause ongoing problems. Uh, Long term, the data are less clear. Uh, there aren't really, we don't really have great evidence around uh, long term exposure to wildfire smoke, but we do have some studies looking at other kinds of air pollution that contain those same small particles. And it does look as though if uh, kids, uh, young kids, are exposed for months to years, it may somewhat increase their risk of developing asthma down the road. Uh, so that's potentially a concern. We're still kind of looking into that. Um, in terms of risk of serious illness, risk of serious illness is mainly in the acute setting. And again, it's mainly for people who have underlying heart or lung disease. And this is because in those very fine particles, you know, big particles, our systems are built to kind of filter those out. And so they, you know, the, your nasal passages kind of stop that stuff from getting down there. But these very fine particles get way down into the lungs and they can actually get into the bloodstream. And this can cause problems for people who have underlying asthma. This can cause people with underlying chronic uh, lung disease like emphysema. <coughs> and it can make their breathing much tougher. It can uh, mess them up and sometimes you know, lead to a need for hospitalization. Doesn't always do that, but it increases the risk. Uh, the biggest risk, though, is for people with heart disease. And the reason is that those fine particles get into the bloodstream and they cause irritation in there. And that can increase the risk in somebody who has underlying heart disease of having a heart attack or potentially having an irregular heart rhythm that sometimes can be dangerous or even fatal. Again, this is not something that happens all the time, but there is a small increase in the risk of that. And that's the reason we try to 
really try to encourage people to avoid being out uh, in the smoke as much as possible. Um, so who is at higher risk? Again, I've already mentioned people who have underlying heart disease or lung disease are the folks who are at potentially the biggest risk from, uh, uh, from exposure to wildfire smoke. Um, and uh, we also think about kids though. Kids spend a lot of time outside. They spend a lot of time running around. Uh, and the amount of air that they breathe compared to the, you know, how big they are is more than for an adult. And so they may be more at risk for some of these other uh, symptoms like getting severe cough and, uh, and if they have asthma, that can certainly be a problem for them. Uh, if, uh, if somebody's elderly, they may run into problems, not necessarily uh, just because they're over 65, but people over 65 maybe are more likely to have underlying lung or uh, heart disease. And so that's one reason uh, we encourage people to try to avoid uh, being in the smoke. We don't have a lot of data with regard to pregnant women from wildfire smoke, but we do know from tobacco smoke and the fine particles that are in there that sometimes that can cause problems with a pregnancy. And so we just think it's prudent for uh, pregnant women to think of themselves as potentially uh, vulnerable. And finally, for people who are homeless or people who uh, may have to work outside all the time, just because they're exposed to the smoke for longer periods, they may be more likely to have some of the, uh, the symptoms that you've experienced. And in particular, it's a concern if they have underlying heart or, or lung conditions. So what can you do to reduce the risk? And again, this is especially important for those people who are at risk for severe, serious problems like people with heart or lung disease. Uh, since the risk is basically due to the amount of smoke that you're exposed to and the total time that you're exposed, the more time you're inside in a less smoky uh, space, the better off you are. And so spending some time in inside is good. If people can leave the area, and uh, Lillian referred to this, if you can leave the area uh, for a time and you're in a place that doesn't have smoke, then that's potentially a, a great strategy. Not everybody has that option, of course. And Lillian alluded to this, people with heart disease and lung disease in particular <coughs> should strongly consider getting a, an air filter. Because, again, if you use an air filter that is, they're shown to be effective in decreasing the amount of these fine particles that are, uh, that are uh, in the air indoors, and they keep working. Even though the smoke stays heavy outside, they work in order to keep the level of these, uh, these fine particles down. And so, uh, the more time you can spend in a place uh, which has, uh, which has uh, cleaner air, the better off you are, the less time you're exposed to, uh, uh, to these uh, fine particles. So, uh, I think Belle is going to have a few questions for us that she's going to pepper us with. Uh, but, so, I'll be talking with you again a bit later, but I'm turning it over <laughs> to Jackson. Thank you. So good morning and thanks for having me here today. Uh, before I start, and one, I'm going to keep the introductory remarks short so we have more time for the panel, but I'd like to get an idea by show of hands, how many of you live in Jackson County? Oh, I'm wow, so vast majority. Now keep your hands up, oh, sorry, <laughs> keep your hands up if you live in Ashland. Okay, so it seems like about a majority from Ashland. Just good to know who we're speaking with in this case. So uh, during wildfire events, Jackson County Public Health collaborates with several agencies and community partners. We collaborate with the Oregon Health Authority, Department of Environmental Quality, the National Weather Service, local school districts, the medical community, the media, many others including the Ashland Chamber of Commerce. 
The primary objective we have is to ensure that the public and community partners are informed of health risks of smoke and what they can protect themselves. Well, I hope this summer was the worst summer that we've seen, and it certainly was the worst summer I've seen. I've lived in this area for about 20 years. Hope is a poor planning tool, and so we're going to continue working with our community. <laughs> I didn't know that would be a laugh, so I'm using that. <laughs> so, hope is a poor planning tool. <laughs> so we're going to continue to work with our community to make sure that we're better prepared for wildfire events and can have a better response to those. So thank you. So if that's on your, if hope is one of your emergency preparedness planning things you're putting in your box, you might want to replace that with water or something. Else. <laughs> Just paraphrasing what you're saying. Thank you. <laughs> Jackson, can you, um, I think the number one question that I hear for health professionals is what about masks? How do masks help or not help? What kind of masks work? Um, what should we be considering when we're looking at those? Yeah, so first off, as Richard said, the best protection from smoke is to stay inside if you can. However, I know that's not possible for everyone. If you have to be outside for prolonged periods of time, a respirator can actually help you. I want to distinguish between what people call masks and respirators. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. A uh, surgical mask, a dust mask, a wet bandana, a napkin, those aren't helpful. Those aren't respirators. So if you are going to wear a respirator, number one, it needs to be the right type. And there's a lot of information around on this, and I actually have a handout at the table by the door. Yeah, from the EPA. Thank you. So it needs to be the right type, marked NIOSH with N95 or P100, and also needs to be properly fitted, and that could be challenging. Um, living in this community, I mean, I actually live in Medford, uh, during the worst smoke events, I commonly see people riding around on bicycles, going places. Surgical masks, they have beards, there's open areas of them. They're not the right type, and they're not fitted properly to their face. So they need to be properly fitted. And this handout actually describes how to properly fit the mask to you. Um, importantly, respirators aren't designed for children. And if you have facial hair, it's not going to work. It's not going to provide any protection for you. Importantly, as Richard said, if you have underlying heart or lung condition, excuse me, conditions, you really need to consult with your medical provider first. Simply put, wearing a respirator makes it difficult to breathe. Uh, even healthy adults find it uncomfortable to wear respirators for a long period of time. So with that said, in summary, respirators are really a last resort that can be beneficial for some, but it can also give us a false sense of security. And again, there are that those respirators are dealing with particulate matter, what we call that PM 2.5 that Richard was talking about. Uh, they don't filter out the gases. So understand that they're not a perfect solution, but they can be helpful for some populations if you get the right type and fit it right and wear it according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just going to ask uh, Dr. Lehman a follow-up. So, so if I, I'm wearing a mask and I feel better, that means it's working. <laughs> I've never been, I'm sure none of us have been asked. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, I do some do some things other than masks that make me feel better. <laughs> 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 but I don't know, okay, that's I don't know these numbers because <laughs> I did the thing. So, so yeah, I, I think with with um, respirators, uh, as as Jackson was saying, it's kind of tricky because they were developed. Uh, they were developed for use in the workplace and in healthcare. So you know, I used them. Not, now I can't because of this, but um, I, I used them uh, before in healthcare, and they're not. They're typically for use for short periods of time, and they are for use in a setting where people have had a chance to get formally fit tested in order to make sure that they're working and that there's a a good seal so that stuff isn't going around the sides of the mask or underneath because if that's happening it's as Jackson mentioned it's just not doing you a heck of a lot of good unfortunately um, so I think as he pointed out uh, if people can get 
fit tested to use them correctly and sometimes that may be possible uh, in the healthcare setting um, to, to uh, uh, get appropriately fit tested. You can, you can have a bit more confidence that they're actually doing you some good. There was a study that they did during Hurricane Katrina where uh, these N95 uh, respirators were distributed to people who were going back in and cleaning up mold uh, and they, they you know, chatted with a bunch of these folks and they found out that one in four of them did, uh, one in four of them even put it on correctly. So three-fourths of the people were not putting it on right. Uh, which means that it's probably not going to work all that well. So uh, I think that particularly for the folks who have heart and lung disease, who are the folks who really are at highest risk for severe problems, I am concerned that it could create, as, as Jackson mentioned, a, a false uh, sense of security. So I'm not saying don't wear masks, but I can't promise you that they're protecting you effectively unless you wear them the right way and you have appropriate fit testing. Thank you. We could probably talk about that all day, but I'll move us on. Um, can Dr. Lehman, or the other things that you do, today, um, could you talk to us about um, other tools that are available? You mentioned HEPA filters, maybe a little more information on that, um, sure. or as well as other tools. Sure. And uh, so HEPA filters are, uh, I think, well, I won't say they're the best thing since sliced bread, but I think that they are very, they're very reasonable for somebody to consider if somebody has these underlying conditions of, of chronic uh, uh, underlying lung condition, including asthma, or people who have heart disease. Because uh, they work, we've got good evidence that they work well, and as, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, if the smoke is heavy outside and you have a place inside that's a refuge and where you've got clean air, uh, I think that uh, that's an easy way for, uh, for a person to avoid that ongoing exposure. And when you go out in a car, if you need to run out and run errands, and of course people do have to run errands, if you can put the air on, recirculate in the car, that also is helpful in terms of um, protecting you during that trip from uh, exposure to the uh, to the fine particles. So again, uh, for people with uh, with heart conditions or lung conditions, long story short, the um, the less time that you're actually out and exposed to uh, to the particles, the better. Thank you, um, Lily. And another tool I think that we've talked about is um, staying inside with air conditioning. And of course, not everyone has air conditioner. A common practice here is um, is to really you know open your windows at night, right? Because it's cooler, and you finally will cool off during the day. You'll wake up to a nice cool morning before it gets hot again. Thoughts for someone who doesn't have air conditioning either in their home or car or otherwise? Yeah, I think that's a really tough one. Um, I think that what we're experiencing uh, with the fire seasons is also heat. We're having heat related problems as well. We're having higher temperatures that are lasting for longer uh, and they're showing up at strange times of the year. You know, uh, we have August weather at 4th of July, things like that. So we have to put the combination, I think, of heat stress along with what we're experiencing with the results of wildland fires. And, um, you know, I don't, the, my experience uh, looking at the the heat maps that we have, you, it isn't cooling down in them. Uh, so that you can't count on that as to, you know, kind of get your air recirculated. And the smoke isn't going to go away in them. The particulate matter isn't necessarily going to go away in them. So I think that that's, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, Richard was uh, saying, you know, as, as neutral as we can, our biggest fear is having people have something that they think will protect them, and then it won't. You know, it's, uh, you know, to be cautious, to really look at the different tools. We've talked about filters, we've talked about respirators, we've talked about staying inside, we've talked about uh, community uh, shelters, etc. But understanding what they can do and what they can't do. That being said, um, 
you know, I just think it's always really important for us to understand what exactly is the risk we're talking about. You know, and you heard uh, Dr. Lehman speaking about, you know, there's things that we haven't seen really have emergent long-term effects that we've seen that are emergencies. We haven't seen more, for instance, uh, cardiac arrest this winter that we would expect. You know, things that we know that this is particularly a problem with people with underlying heart disease. But So I think we also have to um, not live in fear, but live with, with your community solutions and work on that. But there just isn't one, there, you know, just isn't one bullet that we can give you or one assurance that we can give you. Um, and that's, that's hard for scientists to, like, say, you know. Uh, we are learning. We learned, we know more than we did three or four years ago. We know that we have to pay more attention. We have to do uh, what we call surveillance, not, you know, not like the government calls surveillance, but really <laughs> looking at, you know, what is happening in a community in terms of health outcomes. And we're doing that, and we're trying to do it as much as we can, and sharing it with communities in real time. So actually, Bill, just yeah. thanks, Lillian. And just to add to that, uh, the the information that we have about uh, the the health effects, the more serious health effects of the fine particles that we've been talking about, is for is from. Uh, other types of air pollution that also contain these. We don't really have a lot of, of uh, really great scientific information where there's been research done in the setting of wildfires yet. Uh, so we do know that when uh, these fine particles from other kinds of air pollution uh, uh, that they can potentially cause problems for people with these underlying health conditions we've talked about. It may be that there are other things in urban air pollution that are making that worse and that are not showing up in wildfire smoke. I don't know. I wish I did know, because then I could tell you. But I think that because we do know that these fine particles can have these effects, that's why we think it's it's prudent, it makes sense, it's reasonable to try to avoid exposure to them. Thank you. And Jackson, I wanted to touch on a few things that have been mentioned, but maybe we can talk about what's happening locally. Um, I've had the question of, are there mandatory evacuations for smoke? Is that something we foresee? What's it, um, are, are there shelters that might be available for folks if that was an opportunity, you know, necessary? What, what can folks do? What's gonna happen in that sense? And we haven't had uh, mandatory evacuations for smoke. Typically during a wildfire event, the evacuations are a result of the fire threatening structures, uh, threatening human life. However, when the smoke gets unhealthy or worse, we do recommend that vulnerable populations, that sensitive groups, leave the area if they're able to do so. With that said, many people can't do that. In fact, the majority of people don't have the option to do that. Uh, they're not mandatory eva evacuations. During the high smoke and heat periods this year, uh, there were various churches that provided cooling shelters that also acted as, as cleaner air shelters. I also understand that Southern Oregon University had opened up a building as a cleaner air shelter. And people can also go to malls and libraries for short periods of time. But moving forward, and I think Lillian mentioned this, this is something that requires some work in terms of identifying cleaner air shelters and publicizing those to make sure people know where those actually are in the future. So that's something to work on. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Lillian, just in terms of like public health approach to this, because we're seeing this as ongoing, right? Is this, is this related to other climate change issues that public health deals with? Because I know public health both at the state level and the local level uh, does work on climate change issues. How does that relate to um, wildfires and maybe other issues in the climate change spectrum? Well, we do know that these trends are observable and that we've seen them. Uh, and looking at that without prescribing you know, causes, we do know that we have to mitigate how far approaches are. So some of the things that um, we know with the shifts in environmental and climate conditions, we want to help people build this community resiliency. Um, some of the data, I think, is, is uh, really 
catching us, you know, not like by surprise when you look at it. Between 2000 and 2011, our whole state only had 10 or fewer days of poor air quality. And you've seen some of the maps from the last, uh, the last, you know, that's Blue Mountain area, that's all over the state, 10 or fewer days of quality. What we have seen since 2012 is we've had 20 summer days with poor air quality or extremely poor air quality. So looking at that, we have to say, this is again, this is not just, we can't just blame us on wildfires. We have to look at it more holistically. We have to decide uh, how are we going to look at this, uh, what we're building with, how we're giving recommendations to people about recreational options, uh, what our choices are. Uh, you know, we're trying to work together with communities. We have some pilots around the state. Uh, out in the Bend area, in the Deschutes County and Crook County area, working with communities to see what are some of the things that they would like to come up with from their day-to-day -day work in the community and their day-to-day -day approach, um, how with the schools, et cetera, they want to think about uh, adapting to these changes that we're seeing. So um, we know that um, there's a lot of sources to air pollution, for instance, that are contributing factors uh, Dr. Layman, you know, mentioned even, you know, cigarette smoke. You know, there's things in the cigarette smoke that are not uh, not good for us and, and our cardiovascular and lung. <coughs> but what we're trying to look at with other agencies across the state is um, exactly what is the ecosystem in Oregon and what are some of the recommendations that communities can uh, talk about their own life and talk to us about what they would like to see us to research and to give them information about um, as we move forward. But the, the projections are, and there's a lot of research on this, that this will be a continuing trend um, that we need to, to understand. I, I think, and this is kind of a, a, a sidebar, one of the things that happened this year with the structure fires that we've seen more and more, particularly in California, and working with first responders uh, not only are you know, our, our civilians uh, at greater risk, but obviously our first responders are at greater risk. And now we're trying to figure out what are the other things that are in the air from the structure fire that is in addition to the okay. things that we find in the wildland fire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you think about it, you know, houses burned down, they have particle board, you know, they have roofing material, you know, like just trying to anticipate what are some of the things that we need to think through and get more data and information about <coughs> recommendations about um, maybe what we build with, you know, in these interfaces, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, trying to look at it more holistically, though, and not just this is a health problem, this is a economic problem, or this is a forest service problem, but really coming to a, a community solution. And I know that sounds, you know, a little wonky, you know, or like a, um, maybe a cliche, but uh, we're really understanding that this is the only way for these complex solutions uh, to be ferreted out and tested, and, you know, and we're going to make mistakes, and then hopefully, you know, we can come back to the drawing board when it starts raining every year and think about what can we do better and, and know better and share better among uh, our communities. Great, thank you. Just looking if anyone else had other stuff to add to that, Jackson? Oh, no, not to that. I did <laughs> want to, if there was time, I did want to talk about the uh, kind of the best resources for identifying air quality for folks. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question about that. So when I uh, was working in Jasper County about 15 years ago, they said, if it, if you can't see that mountain over there, and it had a name, of course, I didn't know the name of because I didn't live there. They said, then you should cancel football practice. <laughs> I felt like that was a bad way. <laughs> Some people could see the mountain better than I did. I didn't even know what mountain they were referring to. And I just didn't feel like that was an adequate public health practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it wasn't scientific to me. Um, but that was the rule of thumb, right? So, you have other ways that we can look at that, Jackson? Yeah. Well, one, I wanted to bring everyone's attention. There's a lot, of course, when you go online, you can find a lot of different uh, websites regarding air quality. But the Department of Environmental Quality, also known as DEQ, their air quality index can be found on a, a site called the Oregon Smoke Blog. 
you can use a search engine or in Smokeblog, it'll pop up. Um, if you need the actual address, it's the, uh, I won't say www, but that's what it is. <laughs> Oregon Smoke, that's one word, dot blogspot dot com. So Oregon Smoke dot blogspot dot com. Now this is an excellent site that actually shows the air quality monitors. It also contains various other information about health effects from smoke. It's, it's operated by the DEQ. The press releases from Jackson County, from cities, from the state, those all get put there. So I recommend you look at that site first. Everyone's, uh, a lot of people aren't on a computer and using their smartphone. So there's also a site from DEQ called Oregon Air. And to get to it, search Oregon Air one word in your apps. And you'll be able to see what's going on in terms of all the different uh, smoke monitors in the area. But getting to Bell's point, a lot of people don't live close to air quality monitors. There aren't a lot of monitors based on the, uh, the geographic area and the number of people we have in, in Jackson County. So there is a visibility index that's actually found on the smoke log. It's called the 531 Visibility Index. Um, and to back up a bit, as you know, you may be looking at a monitor in Ashland or Medford, but Applegate's going to look entirely different, or Shady Cove could look entirely different. Um, so if you go to the smoke log, you can find that. But simply put, if visibility is over five miles, the air is generally good. If it's about five miles, maybe over, but the air is hazy and moderate, kind of like it probably is right now, uh, it's probably moderate. Under five miles, it's probably unhealthy for sensitive groups. Under three miles, the air quality is likely unhealthy for everyone in that unhealthy category. And if it's under one mile, which we experience for much of this summer, unfortunately, it's probably very unhealthy or hazardous. So it's a conjunction of going to take visibility, looking at the air quality monitors. The air quality monitors can lag behind by about an hour. So it's a good idea to actually use your eyes and look at those monitors. Thank you. And I'm getting the hook from Representative Marsh over here. I just want to um, say one more thing is that I, I think, as we saw, we're all in this together. Sometimes we have neighbors that don't have access to this type of information or literally hate the media and will never pay attention, but might have these sensitive <laughs> groups, right? So if we can not only help ourselves and help with our harm reduction of our own health, we can help our neighbors help, um, and there's some great materials. Lillian's reminded me on the front table over there at, at, by the door. Please take some. But remind us that we're part of this community together. So we might have an elderly couple or uh, small kids down the street or even the homeless man that we pass by. And anyway, I think that we can continue to inform and help each other. I think we'll be better off as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a tremendous point because uh, really what it boils down to a resilient community is one where people you know know them know who's in the neighborhood know who might need a little bit of extra help when it gets really hot or uh, really smoky and checks in checks in on them. and that that's what makes the difference in a resilient community Perfect.